today we're here with Lisa Higgins of Lasar. Lisa, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to meet with us. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Nice, beautiful, foggy day out here. <laughs> but it's really conducive to scent work. Exactly. So tell me a little bit about Lasar. Lasar is Louisiana Search and Rescue Dog Team. Mm -hmm. It got its start in November of 89 with a meeting of people in the neighborhood that felt we could do some kind of work with dogs. Mm -hmm. Um, we acquired our first dog and started training it, a golden retriever named Frosty, <laughs> in May of 90, uh, March of 90, mm -hmm. and then got our very first response in May of 91. Since that time, our organization has been requested over 700 times. 700 times. Now you're 501c3, so you're nonprofit. We are. Okay, does anybody contribute to the funding to this? Not at all. Um, we do hold a canine seminar from time to time, once a year usually. Mm -hmm. And that helps put a few dollars in our account, which goes toward ham radios for our handlers. Mm -hmm. um, we try to help with schooling when possible. Mm -hmm. um, some of our training comes from canine seminars across the country. Mm -hmm. But those cost, it's not anything you right. just happen up on. Right, so um, what are some of the agencies that you've worked with? Well, we actually work with any local, state, or federal agency that requests us. Mm -hmm. We do not run because the newspaper or the news says someone's missing. Mm -hmm. It must come through authoritative channels, the okay. police department, sheriff's office, mm -hmm. or so on. Um, we do do work with the FBI as well, so mm -hmm. we cover just about all bases. Wow, and you do it all over Louisiana or Actually, anywhere else? Or? we're not held to a jurisdiction. Okay. Um, we've done cases as far away as Anchorage, Alaska oh, and wow. Puerto Rico. Wow. <laughs> so what exactly do y'all do? What different techniques are? Um, we try to train our dogs in most of the scent work that is required out there. For example, we do area search where a dog works off the air currents to find mm -hmm. uh, a missing person, say, in the woods. Mm -hmm. Um, we also teach tracking trailing where a dog works on a line and harness, mm -hmm. um, may have to track a person step for step, mm -hmm. may work just off that trail where the, um, the scent is more readily available to the dog. We also do recovery work, both land and water. So that means that our dogs are trained to find buried victims, mm -hmm. um, the occasional uh, person that succumbs to an unknown condition, mm -hmm. um, homicide. Mm -hmm. But we do not only current homicide, but cold case as well. We also train our dogs to work historic and prehistoric cases as well. Um, and water. Yes, we do find people underwater. In fact, we may be the first team to prove in Louisiana that that could be done. May of 91, um, three boys tried to cross the Amy River. Mm -hmm. And that very first dog, Frosty, mm -hmm. helped locate the final person that had not been found yet. How does that work? I mean, scent is going to break surface. Okay. All the dog has to do is tell us where that's happening. Okay. What breeds do y'all use the most? We we tend toward the medium to large dogs. Mm -hmm. um, your working sporting breeds: Labs, Golden Retrievers, Australian Shepherds, German Shepherds, Belgian Malinois. Mm -hmm. um, dogs that are known for working with people. How long is a dog in training? W when do you typically start the training? Well, we like to start them at eight weeks old, little mm -hmm. bitty puppies, and mm -hmm. they grow up believing they're the best search dogs ever. <laughs> it's built on a, a game of positive reinforcement. Mm -hmm. um, we like to start with live find first because the puppy and the handler training together learn what does scent do. How long does it take usually to train? Um, well, we start, like I said, we start at eight weeks old, typically 12 to 18 months before mm -hmm. they're certified to go out into the field. So we can't just go out there and teach a dog, okay, a week, find that trail? No. Aww, <laughs> Not man. the way it works. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that will dispel some of these fake tracker dogs or something. Or you know, Just because your dog has a good nose doesn't make it an automatic tracker. Correct. Okay. So that does. And what about certification? Do you, your dogs start right. certify for that? They do. Our dogs have to certify because we could go to court on any one of these mm -hmm. cases. We have to be able to prove that a dog is tested at what we say we can do mm -hmm. by outside individuals that do not train with the dogs on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we like to keep in-house one year and then go outside the next year too. We like to choose those organizations that are accepted through law enforcement readily mm -hmm. because they're going to know what those standards are and that if we pass that test, we know what we're doing. Good. Within reason, of course. <laughs> I think everything's subjective, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so what types of searches, and I think you've kind of touched on this already, what types of searches have y'all been called to do? I, um, more often, I guess. Well, we do get called for the um, Alzheimer patient that might walk away from home or from the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, children who either little kids who have walked away or teenagers who have run away. Mm -hmm. um, hunters who have succumbed to temperatures or what have you mm -hmm. and didn't come home. We might have to find them. So let's say one of my little boys just turn around and walk off and I know you, I can just call you and say, hey, Lisa, I need a dog. Well. <laughs> Call me, but hurry up and get with law enforcement because I cannot <laughs> respond without them. <laughs> so, so you do wait for the official call? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And that can come from law enforcement, FBI, any Absolutely. government authority? In your case, whichever parish you lived in or mm -hmm. town that you lived in, if you had a police department or a sheriff's office that was in charge of it, mm -hmm. they would have to call. They would have to give you a call. How old must you be to apply to Lasar? <laughs> You can apply as young as 12 years old if your parents are willing mm -hmm. because they have to take you to training mm -hmm. and be able to stay there and take you home. Mm -hmm. um, we have a junior members that runs from 12 to 17 years old mm -hmm. and then from 18 on are the rest of us. You cannot respond to a search until okay. you're at least 18. Okay. Now in the case of our junior members, um, we do have a young junior who has um, actually helped on a drowning, mm -hmm. has actually helped uh, locate a Civil War cemetery that was unmarked. Wow. And in that case, uh, a supervising adult must be there. Mm -hmm. In her case, it was me, her granny. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, it would be mom or dad mm -hmm. who brings the child to and from practice. Okay, cool. So they practice up until, well, I mean, they're going to continually practice, but they don't get to go out on an official search until they're 18. Correct. Okay, that Correct. definitely makes sense for liability. Mm hmm. All right, so, well, I think that's everything, unless you okay. have something else. Is there anything in particular that you want the public to know that we didn't talk about already? That we're here, and if needed, please contact your local sheriff's office and mention us. We cannot come without an official call, but we're willing to help. We train every day. We're on call 365 mm -hmm. every day, <laughs> every day, 24 hours a day. So. Call us if needed, but it's got to come through law enforcement. Okay. I actually met with Lisa a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about financing the trip and some of the calls that she goes out on. And what people don't realize is being a nonprofit, motels, food, travel, gas, everything. Veterinary expenses. Even though the government's calling you and putting you to work, the government does not foot the bill. We are a 501c3. We volunteer. Now, mm -hmm. if a department chooses to put gas in our tank, we are ready to accept it. Yeah, absolutely. If they need us to stay overnight um, in a town that's farther from home than is comfortable to drive home and come back the next day, if they would like to put us up, it's appreciated, but it's not a deal breaker. We're coming anyway. You're if coming there's a need, anyway. We're coming. Okay, sounds good. Well, thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. Lisa Higgins with Lasar Dog Team. And stick with us, we've got more interesting footage to come. Hi, you're back. Great. Are you ready to talk about the most awesome part of your dog? I mean, besides the 100% loyalty and affection? Yeah, today we're going to talk about your dog's nose. As you know, a dog's nose is way more sensitive than ours, where we may have about five to six million um, sense receptors in our nose. A dog can have up to 300 million, depending on the breed. Let's talk about 10 unexpected things that your dog can smell. Number 10, bacteria. As you all know, our bees are currently dying. Since the 1970s, beekeepers have trained dogs to find deceased beehives before they've had a chance to infect healthier swarms. 
This process allows beekeepers to inspect up to 100 colonies in 45 minutes. Before then, it would take them at least two days for humans to do the same work alone. Number nine, and one that we may not think of very often, but DVDs. Dogs can be taught to detect the material polycarbonate, a key component of all DVD discs. They can thereby help to bust massive DVD counterfeiting trade in places like Southeast Asia. Number eight, drowned bodies. And we talked a little bit about this in our interview with Lasar. Water search dogs are often used by police in the USA to locate and recover drowned corpses. But how exactly could a dog smell a body through all that water? Well, the scent of drowned bodies are released into the water currents, which then end up being released into the air. At that point, you have your air scent dogs that can pick up the scent. They can do that from land, they can do it from a boat, or even while they're swimming in the water. There's also a little spot on the roof of their mouth that they can taste skin rafts while they're in the water. So they use this to track the scent to its strongest point, which is usually the body itself. And since humans shed approximately 40,000 skin rafts per minute, the shedded skin rafts float on the water's surface and the dog can still smell you. That old adage about run through running water so the dog can't track you, it's not going to apply anymore. <laughs> Number seven, back during the Vietnam War, ambushes and Viet Cong equipment. The dogs were not only able to smell humans, but they were also able to detect tunnels, weapons, and booby traps, which ended up saving hundreds, if not thousands, of US soldiers. Since barking would give away their location, the dogs were taught alternative ways to indicate that they picked up on a scent or that they found something. Some dogs would twitch an ear. Um, some dogs would look a specific way. Um, Dalton, for instance, has a habit of raising his little right paw and curling it under when he finds something that he's been tracking. Um, number six, and we talked about part of this in our service dog episode, but diabetes. Dogs can detect a rise and fall in your blood sugar. They can detect the onset of seizures. They can be trained to alert their diabetic owners whenever their blood sugar rises to dangerous levels. A few of them, in the case of diabetic attacks, can run and fetch an insulin kit. Unfortunately, they don't have the opposable thumbs to prep that syringe for us, right? Number five, whale poop. Yes, you heard me right, whale poop. Whale poop is often analyzed by scientists to monitor the health of the whales. It often contains important information about their diet. The problem is the poop sinks below the surface so fast that scientists have to be right there, fresh and ready, ready to take action when that time comes. So what do they do? They train dogs. They take them out on the boat with them. The dogs smell it. They're right there, ready to go with their equipment. The dogs can trace this scent from a distance of more than one mile, and they can lead scientists to the smelly treasure. When the dogs detect the scent, they have a way of notifying the captain of the boat which way to go. Some dogs will turn their head, saying, go this way, go that way. Other dogs have been trained to twitch an ear, and the captain watches the dog's ear to know which direction that boat needs to go in. Okay, and number four, bed bugs. The modern age of widespread air travel is causing a near apocalyptic surge in the number of cases of bed bug infestations, hotels, even in our own homes. In response to this, pet in response to this, pest control services have sprung up whereby in exchange for a hefty fee. A dog will sweep through your house and sniff your furniture to detect bed bugs. Surprisingly, it's been found to be more than 96% effective. Number three, 
minerals and ores. The government in Finland financed a program that taught dogs to detect valuable sulfide containing rocks. When the rocks break apart, they release a smell not unlike rotting eggs. Come on folks, we know what that smells like. The dog can track the smell easily. Um, so can we. Anyway, <laughs> it ended up saving a whole lot of time and during one hunt a dog found a deposit of great economic significance. Number two, ovulation in cows. No need for whining and dining, cows are often impregnated by artificial insemination. But because bull semen is so expensive, many farmers can only afford to artificially inseminate the cows when they're definitely ready to get pregnant. Time it badly and there would be an awkward conversation with the bank manager somewhere down the line. As a result, some farmers have started using specially trained dogs to detect when a cow is in heat. In fact, these dogs have become so good at it, they often detect a cow in its cycle, often before the bull does. And number one, and I'm pretty sure we, we've heard this before, and again, it was touched on in our service dog episode, but the number one thing on this list was cancer. Cancer stinks in more ways than one. But cancer cells have a distinctive smell that can be picked up by the super sensitive nose of dogs. In patients with lung or breast cancer, it is known that these waste products are exhaled whenever a patient breathes. So a group of dogs have been trained to sniff people's breath and alert them if they smell that distinctive cancer smell. We'll have more information for you, a couple of websites that you can look at. One of them will talk about specifically how a dog's work, the inhale, the oil refractory senses, the exhale, and how a dog can separate those scents. Another website will sit up here and give you more information on search and rescue and how those dogs are trained and what they can do and how they classify each dog as to what its specialty is. And again, let, let us know what you think. So until then, we'll continue talking about dogs and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Today we're working with Sven and Diana. Sven is a self-trained service dog who is just getting introduced to Diana's wheelchair. So today we're going to be working on healing techniques to get him to learn to stay close but not quite in the way. Heel, on trail, heel, on trail, heel, on trail, heel. On trail heel. There we go. Ease up. Ease up. Ease up. That's too far. <laughs> Come on, Sid. Tom here. Tom here. Good dog. Good dog. Come here. Come here. Let's get you back in heel. Come on. Come on. Heel. Right here. Heel. Come on. We're going to heel. <laughs> so maybe if we blocked them together. We can box him in. Box Come him on. in. Ready? On trail, heel. Come on. Ease up. Ease up. Sin. Ease up. Now, one of the things that we do if we're on legs, Sin. Come here. It's whichever way the dog goes that's against what we want him to do. We want to go the opposite way. Okay. So, I don't know how quick you can turn in there. Mm -hmm. But if he starts going too far ahead, turn around and call him backwards. Come on, come on. You shouldn't have to hold him. He should be able to do that because he is used to healing. Come heel, over here. Not Tosh. Opposite way. Come here. Just go, he'll go. Come on, let's go. On trail heel. There we go. On trail heel. Okay. He's up, come. On trail heel, come Turn on. Turn around, call him. On there trail we go. heel. He's up. 
You want to hold on to him while yes. you wheel? Yes. Or on trail heel. I can push you and you can focus on him for a second. That way he can learn. Okay. On trail Let's try that. Let's try that. Okay. Now, when they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks, that's a myth. Finn is, what, nine going I'm on ten? Going on ten, and I've had him since he was a puppy um, right out of quarantine from uh, when Okay, he was right turn. Hawk, 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 <laughs> hawk. We changed up on you, didn't we? Come on. <laughs> on trail heel, on trail heel, on trail heel. Good boy. On trail heel. Ease up languages oh he has all the whole range in him. <laughs> okay let's let him sit for a minute he's starting to balk away sit, yep. give him a little treat give him some love for and give the babies he Come says on. on trail nothing mom i'm thirsty i'm stressed and it's time for a break which is very important in dog training come here swim baby there you go there you go pup up Anytime your dog starts pulling away from you like that and just really just loses focus, don't push him. Because right. at that point, all you're going to, you done lost him. Now, I notice you were using the other commands. I was saying left and right. You're saying gi and... Ha, which is gi is left and ha is right. Okay. And the one thing people don't realize, they'll bring a new puppy in the home, turn it off leash, let it go and the dog will start running to here, there, getting the garbage, and they're like, no, 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 no. The dog doesn't know what no is. You have to teach it. <laughs> so whether you speak English, French, Spanish, German, doesn't matter. It's a second language to the dog. You have to teach them the meaning of the words before you can proceed with actual training. With training, the main thing is 10, 15 minutes, twice a day, right. not all in once. You don't want to overwhelm them. You don't want to tax yourself. And it right. keeps things short, fun, and interesting. Once he gets used to that, <laughs> once he gets used to that chair, I think he'll be able to maybe not visualize it as that's mama's legs for now, but he'll be comfortable enough to actually stay side by side and not try to run off or lag behind or run away. Training silly. has to be silly. He's got to have fun doing it too. He can't just all be work. Ready? Ready? Come on. I drill. I drill. I drill. I drill. I drill. He said, I'm going to get some water. He says, It's hot. I don't know what you guys are thinking. Sin. <laughs> nope. <laughs> he says, That's it. Come here. Come here. Come here. Really this is I need the water. He, he, he says that's it. That's For him, that's, that's, that, that's a wrap. That's a wrap. <laughs>